Okay, my name is Jordan Browning, and I am privileged to serve on the Sisterhood Leadership Team. For those of you that I don't know, just a little bit about myself, this is my family. I am married to Blair. We are a couple of months away from being married for 22 years, and we have four children, three girls and a boy ages 16, 14, 11, and eight. We span all the ages, and I have the privilege of being at four different schools this year. Um, I wanna start today by telling you a little bit about myself when I was in high school. And I am going to bravely share a photo with y'all of me in high school. This is me. Guys, this is me during my awkward bang growing out phase, hence the reason that my clip is at the very peak of my head. Um, but I went to Newman Smith High School in Carrollton, Texas, and yes, we have one alumni in the room. <laughs> one. There's one. Um, but I was a cheerleader for my freshman, sophomore, and junior years of high school. And then at the end of my junior year, I tried out for varsity for my senior year, and I did not make it, which was devastating to me. Because in all honesty, most of my identity in high school was wrapped up in being a cheerleader, and I honestly didn't know anything else. So my background was actually in dance, so when I didn't make cheerleader, the drill team coach reached out to me and she encouraged me to come and try out for the dance team for my senior year. And I went to a pretty big high school, so I honestly didn't really know many people on the drill team, but I wanted to do something. So I tried out and I took a risk and I actually made it. And my first day of drill team camp, is when I met my friend Corey. Now, Corey and I had gone to school together for three years, and we had known of each other, but we had never actually known each other. But it turns out that we actually had a whole lot in common, including that we both wanted to go to Baylor University. So we both applied, we got accepted, and we came to Waco together. And I actually lived with Corey for my entire time at Baylor until we both got married. And I commonly refer to Corey as my constant. She was my constant companion as we left the only homes that we had known and ventured off into the world of college life. She's been a constant encouragement to me through many phases of my life because I still today consider her one of my closest friends. She's always been the best kind of friend to me, the kind that you don't have to explain yourself to and they know what you're thinking before you even say it. And we don't live in the same town, but when we see each other, we pick right back up where we left off. And I've always been able to look back at that detour in my life and as painful as not making cheerleader was for my 17-year-old self, I've always been grateful for the way that God orchestrated those events because it led me to one of the greatest friendships in my life with Corey. And I know that as women, we long for these types of friendships. We long to be known, we long to be understood, we long for someone to read our facial expressions and know what we're thinking without any hesitation. And so far in this study, we first studied Mary, who was related to Jesus, and then we studied the woman at the well and the anointing woman who both had encounters with Jesus, but no history. And this is our first glimpse at two women who truly had a personal relationship with Jesus. And I'm so struck by the type of friendship that Mary and Martha had with Jesus. And the more and more that I studied these passages, the more I'm struck by the fact that I can have this type of friendship with Jesus. I personally often think of Jesus as my shepherd, as someone who leads me and who I follow, who's out in front of me. It's easy for me to think of Jesus as my savior, as someone who's above me and deserves my worship. 
but I honestly don't as often think about Jesus as my friend, as my companion, as someone who walks alongside of me. So today, I'd love for us to look at the relationship that Mary and Martha had with Christ and to learn from them how we can be better friends with Jesus. And as cheesy as that might sound, that's a relationship that Jesus desires to have with us. So if Mary and Martha could sit across the table from us today, I think they would encourage us that to be better friends with Jesus, we need to choose the uncomfortable, we need to choose the unexpected, and then we're gonna wait for the unimaginable. So first off, our first step to being better friends with Jesus is we're gonna choose the uncomfortable, and this is a lesson that we learn from Mary. The first time that we meet her in scripture, Jesus is a guest in her living room, and she chooses to sit at his feet. Now, right before this passage in Luke 10, Jesus is traveling through the country with his disciples, probably coming up from Jericho, and we are not told in the scripture whether or not the disciples stopped at Mary and Martha's house in Bethany along with Jesus, but it is likely that they did. Even if they didn't, it was customary for a crowd to gather in the home of Jesus and listen to him wherever he was being hosted. One commentary that I read said that it is possible that there could have been up to 100 people gathered in Mary and Martha's living room to listen to Jesus' teaching. So we find Mary squished amongst a room full of smelly men who have traveled a long dusty road and she's sitting on the floor. So it's physically uncomfortable. And in addition to that, it's socially uncomfortable. Women were largely discriminated against in this time period that Mary and Martha were living in. And even amongst the Jewish people, they, um, they were excluded from synagogue worship and restricted to more of a spectator role. So Jesus has already defied the cultural odds by accepting the invitation to be a guest in Mary and Martha's home. And now he's allowing this woman to sit at his feet and listen to her her teaching. I imagine that there were whispers, mocking, probably some laughter that Mary saw or heard as she entered that room and took her place at Jesus's feet. Can you imagine how uncomfortable she felt? Yet scripture tells us that she sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. She's not focused on the cold floor or the smelly bodies that are squished around her. She's not focused on the men in the room staring at her and wondering what she's doing there. She's focused on Jesus, and she's listening to her every word, his every word. And Jesus himself admonishes Mary a few verses later by saying, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And I'd love to take a moment to point out something here. We are not told what Mary wanted to do. We are only told what she chose to do. So it's easy to make the assumption that she's lazy compared to Martha being a busybody, that she's the quiet, retrospective Enneagram 2 compared to the hustle and bustle of Martha's Enneagram 3. But the easier and more comfortable place for Mary to have been given the size of the crowd and the cultural climate, would have been to be in the kitchen with Martha. But she chose the uncomfortable place. And it's in this choice, her simple devotion to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to his words that Jesus says can never be taken away from her. The message version of Psalm 27, four says, I'm asking God for one thing, only one thing, to live with him in his house my whole life long. I'll contemplate his beauty. I'll study at his feet. This is the one thing that Jesus says can never be taken away from Mary. So what uncomfortable decisions do you need to make to be better friends with Jesus? We're gonna have real talk with Jordan here. This is really difficult for me. I've actually discovered in the last couple of years that the way that I connect with God the most 
is through really reading and studying his word and writing about it. This is actually the first time that I've written for Sisterhood Study, and when Vanessa reached out to me early last fall and asked me if I could write for this study, this was my response back to her, almost verbatim, because I still have the voice text saved on my phone. It says, I love writing. I've realized in the past few months that it's a really good practice for me because I don't enjoy stillness and solitude and being by myself, but I need to do that in order to write. So it's a discipline for me, and it's grown me a lot. So imagine the irony when after I agree to write a few weeks later, Vanessa gives me the writing assignment to write about Mary and Martha. Is that a prompting of the Holy Spirit or Vanessa being funny? I'm not really sure. But quiet and stillness and solitude, they're all uncomfortable for me but I learned the most about Jesus there. I'm also not a morning person. Mornings are very uncomfortable for me because I would always choose to sleep, but I have had to become a regular at waking up at 5.45 a.m. every weekday morning because that is the only time in my day that I can have uninterrupted time of reading my Bible and spending time with Jesus. So whatever it looks like for you, And however uncomfortable it may feel, I encourage you to lean in to that discomfort. Because just like Jesus promised Mary, those choices are what lead to life and freedom and can never be taken away from you. So the next step that we're going to look at that we can learn from Mary and Martha in becoming better friends with Jesus is to choose the unexpected. For this, we're gonna jump to the passage in John 11 where Lazarus has died. But first, I want us to gain an understanding of what it looked like in this culture when a family member died. We know that when Jesus finally traveled to Bethany, that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. So Mary and Martha, who were Jewish, would have been in the midst of observing what's called Shiva. And during the period of Shiva, mourners would remain at their home for the time period of seven days after their family member's burial, and friends and family would come to them in order to offer their condolences and provide comfort. So in John eleven twenty, 20, when we are told that when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, this would have been very unexpected because individuals that were observing Shiva would not typically leave their home. So then, after Martha encounters Jesus on the road, she returns to her house and she grabs her sister Mary. And verse 31 tells us, when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there. So where did everyone expect Mary to go? To the tomb to continue her mourning. But where did she actually go? She went out to the road to meet Jesus. The crowd of people that were gathered around them thought that she was getting up to go to Lazarus' tomb because that's what the cultural expectation was. They expected her to go to the place of death, and she chose to go to the giver of life. And I'd love to point out an observation here. Martha returns to the house to grab her sister Mary, and in verse 30 it says, Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met met him. He was waiting for them. The best kind of friends always wait for you. He didn't want there to be any confusion about where he was. He wasn't at the tomb. He wasn't in the town. He literally was at a random place in the road waiting for them. And he graciously waited to be able to embrace them both and comfort them in their sorrow. So in both of these instances, both Mary and Martha did not choose what was expected of them, which would have been to stay at home and continue their mourning. Instead, The unexpected choice was to go out to the road and meet Jesus. 
in today's world and culture, we have lots of opportunities to make the unexpected choice of going to meet Jesus. Do your friends or family expect you to respond in situations with anxiousness or worry? Mine do. (laughs) And it's a choice to respond with prayer and surrender over those feelings. Are you in the habit of holding grudges when you feel like someone has wronged you? It's a choice of choosing forgiveness over harboring bitterness. When you're in a crowd, is it expected that you're the one that's gonna have the latest piece of gossip? It's choosing encouragement over tearing down people with your words. Um, This is also hard for me, but I'm going a little off script because I wanna tell y'all about my morning this morning. It did not go the way that I had planned. And um, I don't do well being flexible. And this morning, um, my, husband, or my husband always takes my son to school on Tuesday morning so that I can get here early and help with setting things up, but he realized very late at night last night that he had a dentist appointment this morning at 8 a.m., and so I was like, it's okay, I'll take him, but it, it disrupted my morning, it disrupted my routine, and I don't really like that. And then, in addition to that, when I got home, like, and then I was gonna prepare myself and my mind for this time talk, um, my dog had thrown up not one, not two, but three times in my kitchen and living room. And it's tile, but he had thrown up all three times on three different rugs. And so I, in situations like this, how people would expect me to respond is not with patience. And I typically have quick bursts of anger but the Lord allowed me to practice choosing patience and flexibility this morning. And it was a reminder to me that it's always a choice because none of these things come natural to us. We're always gonna have to make the unexpected choice to meet Jesus in those places. And even though we don't get the physical presence of Jesus on these roads, we honestly get something that's even better. It's just a few chapters after this in John 14 that Jesus promises the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. We will have a helper and an advocate forever. And in these unexpected choices, Jesus is always waiting for us there. And he's equipped us to be better friends with him. And he's promised us the Holy Spirit to help make those choices. So we've learned from Mary and Martha, we're going to choose the uncomfortable. We're going to choose the unexpected. And the last lesson that we can learn from them is to wait for the unimaginable. So we get to this point and Lazarus is dead. And he's, it's not even just that he just took his last breath. He has been dead for four days by the time that Jesus arrives on the scene. And Jesus says to Mary and Martha, take away the stone. Now, can we just agree that this is a strange request for someone that's been dead for four days? So Martha, being her typical vocal self, she's the one to object, and she says, but Lord, it's been four days. It's going to stink real bad. That's that's my own paraphrase. Adriana liked it. And Jesus' response to that is, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And what was their response? They took away the stone. Mary and Martha believed. I doubt they ever imagined that their dead brother was going to walk out of that grave alive, but they had enough faith in Jesus to obediently do what he asked of them, and they did it together. They needed each other to finish the task that Jesus had asked them to do, and all Jesus asked them to do was take away the stone. Jesus did the rest, but Jesus allowed them to be a part of this miracle. 
And I want to look at Jesus' prayer as they took the stone away. In the end of verse 41, he says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. So, Do you see that? Jesus loved Mary and Martha, and he was grieved with them in the loss of their brother. But he didn't raise Lazarus from the dead for their benefit. He didn't do it to make them not sad anymore. He raised Lazarus from the dead for the benefit of the people standing there that they might believe. Mary and Martha already believed. We know that because they proved it when they took away the stone. But who else was standing there with them? Remember all the Jews that were in the home of Martha and Mary as they observed Shiva? They followed Martha to the road as she met Jesus, and then they did the same with Mary. A crowd of people had followed them to Lazarus' tomb. And Jesus performed this miracle for the sake of the crowd so that they might believe. It's pretty unimaginable that Lazarus walked out of that tomb alive. It's actually even more unimaginable that Mary and Martha got to actively participate in this miracle. But what's even wilder than that is that the gates of heaven were flung wide open that day as all those Jews that were standing there and witnessed that miracle finally professed their faith in Jesus. Ephesians 3.20 says, God can do anything you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. So we learn from Mary and Martha that to be better friends with Jesus, we need to choose the uncomfortable, we need to choose the unexpected, and we need to wait for the unimaginable. If you look back at this story, it really can be simplified down to choose Jesus every time, in every situation. That's what Mary did when she sat at Jesus' feet, and Martha got it wrong at first, but it's what she did when she ran out to meet Jesus on the road. And I also think that Mary and Martha learned from their deep friendship with Jesus It wasn't about them or their circumstances or their feelings. It was all about Jesus. And Mary and Martha's obedient steps of faithfulness and choosing Jesus in the uncomfortable, in the unexpected, led other people to believe in Jesus. About a year ago, I got a Facebook message from another high school friend of mine. It was a girl by the name of Hope, who I was casual friends with, but I haven't kept up with at all since high school. And she asked me for my address because she wanted to send me something. So I sent it to her, and about a week later, this book came in the mail. And it's actually a Bible study that was co-authored by Hope, which a little bit took me by surprise because I honestly didn't remember her being a believer. And it had a note with it and said to read the book's acknowledgments. So after thanking her husband and her family and her editor, it reads, to Jordan Wimberly Browning and Corey Backus peterson thank you for loving me enough to pray for me in high school and share the gospel with me changed my life forever. So quick recap on my personal timeline. I wasn't friends with Corey until I didn't make cheerleader. So if Corey and I were were with Hope together, it was my senior year. So for 27 years, I have thought that that little detour that my life took back in 1995 when I didn't make cheerleader was about me, because it gave me the gift of friendship with Corey. But when I got this book and I read that acknowledgement, it was my first realization, it wasn't about me. 
Hope and I have been able to reconnect and to message each other, and apparently Corey and I invited her to see the power team when we were in high school, and we also had several conversations with her about the gospel, and we prayed with her, and she said that it planted the seed for her to accept Christ when she was in college. Now, I acknowledge I do not know God's sovereign plan or how he orchestrates time or circumstances, but it is probable that God used the circumstance in my life of not making cheerleader to draw hope closer in relationship to him. I also fully acknowledge that the pain and the sorrow and the circumstances that some of y'all are sitting in is not nearly as trite as a high school student not making a cheer squad. But my encouragement to you is still the same. Choose Jesus every time, in every single circumstance. When it's uncomfortable, when it's unexpected, make it a habit to always choose to be friends with him. Small steps of obedience, because remember, We don't have to perform the miracle. We just have to take away the stone. Maybe you'll get to have a Mary and Martha experience and witness a resurrection moment here on earth, but even if you don't, keep waiting and keep choosing because we are promised that what we will experience in eternity will be unimaginable. Will you all pray with me? Lord, I thank you just for your word, and Lord, I thank you for these women and just how much I have learned from Mary and Martha and just how much I have learned about their friendship with you and how I can be better friends with you. Lord, I pray that we will continue to make those choices over and over and over for all of our days so that it will bring glory and honor to you. And I ask that of every woman in this room, Lord, that you will just give us all the strength, you will give us the endurance to make the uncomfortable and the unexpected choices and to wait on you. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Thank y'all, y'all are dismissed.